behalf of ADI, welcome to The View from the Outside, the grand finale of this series of web events. Our theme for today is what's next for the business of design. My name is Suresh Venkat. Let me introduce our panelists. Hema Ravichandar is a strategic HR advisor. Shilpa Sharma is a craft evangelist and creative entrepreneur. Anshul Jain is a founding partner at the Valmore Action Advisory. Hi, Anshul. Hi. Meeta Malhotra is the founder of The Hard Copy. Anjali Bansal is the founder of Avana Capital. She almost didn't make it on time, but here she is. A very talented sketch artist, Garima Shukla, is back with us. Garima, thank you uh, for being here. Thank you for the lovely sketches in the last two episodes. I'm a big fan. Looking forward to today's sketch. Now, before we get started, I'm going to hand it over to Prakash Khanzode, General Secretary ADI, to say hello. Prakash, over to you. Prakash, you need to unmute. You're on mute. You need to unmute and repeat what you said. Thanks, Venkat. Yeah. Uh, welcome all panelists and welcome uh, all our members and, and audience over here. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you all on this third episode of this third series. And this is actually the view from outside. That's what we, we follow. Uh, just a quick word about uh, Association of Designers of India. We call it in a short ADI. And ADI is a is an association of all professional designers. We are here since last ten years, and we have been organizing fantastic uh, events, talks, and of course, a lot of offline events also with our members. Our membership is is blooming. It's uh, now we are eight chapters across India, and we have like close to thirteen hundred professional members in this organization. Uh, particularly coming to this session and this session is is about uh, taking our design taking our panelists and designers together to have a view of how this uh, how we all see we are seen as from outside and that's what is called as view from outside and particularly this session is uh, as uh, venkat will introduce in in more in detail further about it is what next for the business so welcome to adi and for all the, all of those who are participating, who are audience over here, who are not members of ADI, we warmly welcome you to be a part of ADI's membership. And this membership process is very easy. We have a fantastic user-friendly website. You just have to go to the website, put your credentials, you can take a free membership, and also, of course, you can always upgrade to a professional membership as well. Thanks, Venkat. I think over to you. All right. Thank you, Prakash. And panelists, you're welcome to join ADI as well. It's not just for designers, it's for anybody who's interested in design. Let me dive into the discussion. First question, uh, Hema Ravichandar. Let's talk about the future of the physical office. Many companies rely on a physical office and of late physical co-working spaces to build a company culture. What happens to company culture if we don't have physical offices anymore? Thank you, Suresh. And a very big hello to all the other co-panelists. It's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. Um, you know, if I were to take a step back and at the first point, talk to you a little bit about company culture or any ecosystem culture. It is nothing but individual behavior multiplied by the number of employees or the sigma of all individual behaviors. And therefore, it is uh, not just a what is, but is also a why is. So when you're looking at building company culture, you're looking at what it should be driven by an organizational purpose, a set of values. How do we do it? What is the knowledge? What are the behaviors which will trigger this kind of uh, 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 culture? What are the kind of uh, systems, processes, rituals which will give us this behavior? And finally, what's the kind of leadership demonstration in action that will drive these behaviors? So in a sense, if I were to fall back a little bit on Sanskrit, it is like a Ichha Shakti, the desire or the drive. It is the knowledge or the Jnana Shakti, the behaviors and the triggers that will give you that behaviors. And finally, the Kriya Shakti, which is the actions which will actually drive that. Now, so, in the yeah. current context, which is really um, the second issue and the pandemic and specifically your work from home scenario, what needs to be driven or what behaviors need to be driven needs to be really called out. And I would call them a behavior of collaboration, a behavior of tolerance, high tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty, agility, innovation, and maybe resilience. 
these will be some of the key behaviors that we need in this kind of a context and this kind of contextual situation. But these behaviors will not just come by serendipity. Mm -hmm. They will come from certain rituals, certain processes and systems. And that is what organizations will have to focus on. For example, innovation will really come from creating cross-functional teams, will come from providing uh, you know, platforms like uh, the COVID challenge and the World Design Col uh, uh, Council's COVID challenge, you know, platforms like that. And also maybe a culture of letting people repeatedly know that it's okay to fail. If I look at agility, it will come from empowerment. It will come from giving different people at different levels empowerment, which they're really aware of. It will come from information and information cascades, which are transparent and as clear as possible. If I talk about resilience, it will come from holistic mental and physical health and therefore check-ins, checking in, counseling on people, checking if they are really whole as an individual and able to resilient, resiliently handle this. So all of these really will be key triggers, systems and processes which will give you the behavior, which will give you the kind of culture that you want in this context. All right. So Hema, just a quick follow-up. So you're saying that these kind of uh, behaviors and, and leadership and all the other attributes you mentioned can be built in a work from home culture? A physical office is not critically important? Of course, of course it can be built because you see your drive and your purpose is like a North Star. That's given. You know how behaviors trigger certain or how certain systems, processes and rituals trigger certain behaviors. Hopefully the organization knows that. And then you have to have a leader who walks the talk, okay. who incentivizes right who communicates and who really shows reassurance as well as vulnerability in as transparent a manner as possible. So as I said, the desire, the knowledge and the drive. And that's the kind of leader we all hope for and rarely meet in our lives. All right. It's time to poll uh, the audience and get a mood of the house. Uh, unsure if you can fire poll number one. The question is, do you know what's in brackets, of course, most likely in store for you in the next year or so? Panelists are not allowed to vote. You have four options. Yes, of course, I know what's in store for me. I've been watching all of ADI's webinars. Some days I do, some days I don't. Not a clue, fully stressed out. No idea, but uh, I'm not stressed out. We have seen crises, crises in the past and we have sorted it out. Not a problem. All right, another five more seconds to complete our voting. Okay, here are the final votes. The clear winner is some days I do, some days I don't. I guess that's the nature of uh, this pandemic with the news flows being what they are. And 38% saying, no idea, but I'm not too stressed out. Very few people know what's in store for them. All right, thank you, Anshu. <clears throat> if you can shut the poll off. Shilpa, next question for you. What drove you to create a business like Jaipur? I'm going to give you a few options. Did you create Jaipur because you wanted to create something new? You wanted to become very wealthy with starting a business? Or like Edwin Hillary said, because it's there. Okay, so um, I think it's safe to say that the opportunity um, was just there. I mean, I'd been with um, Fab India for 12 years, been customer facing with Fab India and um, was uh, you know, quite intimate with uh, customers' aspirations, her needs from you know, what she came looking for. And um, you know, there was a clear void in terms of uh, the kind of product that she would have wanted to graduate to if she'd gotten bored of something that she'd you know, always worn, always bought. Uh, there's also you know, a crying need to be able to just um, elevate the whole um, uh, country of origin status of, of, of product from India because look, I mean, the truth is that uh, if you look at the Japanese and how proud they are of their heritage, right? And, and you know, we have this reputation and we've had this reputation in India of producing, um, you know, tacky, grungy, low quality craft product. The truth is that some of the finest product around the world comes from India. Mm -hmm. So our whole attempt at, you know, with Jaipur, uh, needed to be, um, you know, catering to that need for a contemporary aesthetic uh, rooted in traditional influences, rooted in traditional craft. So that, that opportunity was just there. I mean, you know, one of the reasons why I left Fab India is because I kind of became too big for my boots there. And uh, organization <laughs> priority was... 
uh, organization priority was was you know increasing the geographical footprint and there's mm-hmm. nothing right or wrong about these things but you know it was evident to me that it was time to move on mm-hmm. did the the did becoming wealthy figure at all in your decision making matrix sorry i think shilpa's uh, uh, connection is frozen i'm going to uh, can one of you contact shilpa and see if she can reconnect i'm going to go to uh, anjali next anjali as the sole vc on the panel you are going to get a lot of flack it seems to us uh, designers that vcs have an endless supply of money to to fund seemingly loss making ventures like oyo and uber and we work and nothing to fund the design businesses what are vcs looking for in bets like these so there is a large amount of literature out there on what what do vcs want okay but before i go there i want to just thank you all for having me on this uh, panel wonderful to see some old friends here hema uh, shilpa of course uh, people i very much respect and admire uh coming back to vcs and uh, what are they looking for I, i i will not speak very generally i'll tell you what we do and what mm-hmm. we look for mm-hmm. um as avana as a group of people that have come together to create avana we look for innovation led business models mm-hmm. that we believe are fundamentally profitable and sustainably scalable mm-hmm. because in our view these kind of innovative business models are what will solve large problems whether it is okay. employment market linkages access and formalization most vcs will look for an idea that can eventually become big and make money because mm-hmm. when you make scale happen uh we believe that not just scale but actually profitable scale happen that is where value lies and value lies in both financial valuation and returns and so on mm-hmm. as well as social value that enterprises should create mm-hmm. we look for entrepreneurs that have passion that have a absolute sort of belief and a desire to solve a large problem are hard working obviously can take risk uh will have some modicum of good business judgment and commercial mm-hmm. acumen Mm-hmm. and we'll be able to build teams and most of all have learning agility because no new business uh, really stays the same as as it is when it starts so businesses tend to pivot in the early years as they are experimenting with different models mm-hmm. so the the learning kida is a very important one mm-hmm. for us so anjali would you invest in a business i, I know you don't invest in oyo or uber or weaver but uh, one of those businesses which seem to have incredible scale and global reach but seemingly no path to profitability and i no, say seemingly our, because i don't our, know our checkbook is not large enough to think about investing in a ola uber or uh, or oyo at this point i think you should have invited someone from one of their investors here all right it's hard for me to comment but i do admire actually what they have built mm-hmm. i think it took enormous uh, vision risk-taking. and risk taking appetite and hukspa and just the can do to go and organize i mean just think about what they've done right today the way you think about mobility is completely different you don't even think twice about stepping out and calling an uber or calling an ola mm-hmm. so what they have done is changed the way people live and people work okay so i think there's something to be said for that all right let's poll the audience once again uh, to find out if they know what you're talking about poll number 2 do you personally not by googling not by asking people do you know do you personally know what it means to raise money either debt or equity your answers are yes my term sheet is in my back pocket b what is a term sheet c debt yes equity no sort of no both but haven't tried either two more seconds All right, almost an even split between what's a term sheet, which means you know nothing about venture capital investing, most likely know nothing, or you sort of know both. You know a little bit about both from what you've read and seen. Uh, debt is obviously easier to raise than equity. You can just take a loan from a bank. All right, thank you, Anshu. Moving on to our next question, Meeta. If you were managing a design firm like Ray and Kishman today, would you be what you what would you be planning on doing for the next one year? Muting. My right. dog keeps coming in and out because of the she's scared of the rain. Uh, so if I was managing a design firm today, I'd uh, you know Suresh would be a very busy person. Okay. One is that there's the immediate disruption that all businesses are facing, and you know we 
where we speak to the hard copy community a lot and we are hearing this loud and clear that clients are ca either cancelling projects or pushing them out but nobody is moving forward right now there is this whole disruption of you know your team suddenly gone remote overnight and you're trying to figure it out and then there are hard decisions that you have to take around cost cutting profitability all of those but what i would be doing and i don't think a lot of people are doing it is that i would also find the time to raise my head and look around so clear patterns are already starting to emerge out of the pandemic right so companies that were on the fence about digitization no longer have that option they have to move forward they have to digitize mm -hmm. service design is going to undergo a massive transformation space design is going to undergo a massive transformation so i would say that it's also time uh, you know manage the short term of course and i know that it's painful and hard but also start to think about the opportunities that are emerging because of the patterns that we're seeing around us mm -hmm. and start thinking about how you will position yourself and your firm to address these opportunities but you wouldn't think of downsizing at this point would you if you were running a let's say a 50% design firm so i think downsizing to me is always so it, you know that's it's uh, hard to give an absolute yes or no it depends mm -hmm. a lot on the financial okay. health of the firm mm -hmm. right but i would say that downsizing should be the last option for anyone because there are many other things to explore first which is you know a uh, repick up which is possibly the first thing you would do i spoke to somebody in the morning who said we've given up our office space because we can always get mm -hmm. one later if we need so that i think there are other options downsizing should be your last okay. unless your financial health doesn't permit it in which case you have to do what's you know taking off from what meeta is saying uh, Anshul Mita thinks she would she would spend her time preparing for the opportunities that are going to come. You've written an article, and you've talked about something called a long boom. This sounds pretty good. It sounds like a long period of boom. What does this term mean? Uh, well, um, hi Suresh, and a uh, big hello to everyone out there. Um, see, what I uh, what I know is that evolution is not a constant or a gradual process. You know, it happens in sudden, large shifts. in stressful moments mm -hmm. and usually in a crisis mm -hmm. now the last parallel i can draw is actually the uh, and in modern history or modern memory are the wars the first war and the second war mm -hmm. and both the times what the period immediately the follow the first war was the roaring 20s and we all know what uh, mm -hmm. what was created there even creatively art deco actually boomed at that point in time mm -hmm. and uh, so on and so forth i mean uh, there were other reasons why um, it led to um, the great depression but you know many of those factors were already so uh, seeded uh, just after the first war by the political and uh, the economic leadership now those um, errors were actually learned and corrected after the second war and what uh, what we witnessed after was an uninterrupted i think three or four even five decades mm -hmm. of prosperity mm -hmm. uh now uh the question is why does that happen in the time of a crisis mm -hmm. and uh, this is something to really really appreciate uh, in today's context uh for two reasons number one well human habit and behaviors are very hard to change very very hard to change unless uh it's a systemic change you know and crisis affects everyone and because it affects a ecosystem it affects everyone behavioral changes are actually um um uh, actually happening and we can see it now and necessity is really the mother of invention you know so something uh, as a human being we try to mitigate our risk and avoid what is uh, happen mm -hmm. so this does change behavior it does change habits and habits uh actually change attitudes that's uh, that's what we we've, uh, we've learned and uh, on the supply side actually whatever uh is um, happening uh in moments of crisis puts a huge pressure on resources mm -hmm. so uh i i totally agree with meeta it's not about downsizing actually what happens is you cut out a lot of fat from mm -hmm. the system mm -hmm. you become leaner you become uh, sharper you become more nimble as an organization and again this is happening at a systemic level mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Both these things put together create an ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, which after the war, in fact, that period was called long boom. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the many of those uh, uh, economic macro factors, you can see present today as well. Okay. Um, you know, when you, uh, there's another aspect of human behavior, which is uh, very interesting. You know, we are normally risk averse, mm -hmm. but when you lose money, yeah. you're willing to take risks. In fact, you need to take risks. And that is where creativity uh, actually booms. Innovations boom. Mm -hmm. uh, after the war, it was uh, technology that led to innovation, mm -hmm. assembly line, and many other things. Mm -hmm. Color uh, TV, um, uh, uh, yeah. movies, sound and uh, color movies. We talk about, uh, you know, whole jazz. We talk about the dance clubs. Mm -hmm. A whole thing. You know, the, the women liberation, which... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, after the, because they had to work in the factories and that liberated them, actually activated a huge uh, creative leap and opportunity. So I totally agree with the Vita and I I'll reconfirm that as we prepare, as we prepare to survive today, equally important is to make the COVID era golden era of creativity. Uh, I think so uh, we should brace ourselves for that. That's good news, Samanchal. We uh, history tells us that we're all set to have an uh, economic and social boom after this period. Shilpa, next question to you. Same as I asked uh, Meeta. If you were still running Jaipur today, what are the things you'd be planning to do for the next few months? Three to six months, for instance. Okay, I'm going to start off by saying that I'm not here to speak on behalf of Jaipur anymore. I, I would just speak uh, as full an disclaimer. You have yeah. sold Jaipur yes. off. You don't own it anymore. But if you were running a business today, a retail business today? You know, if I was running a retail business today, I think I would focus a lot more on the overall experience, um, straddling um, online and um, offline. I mean, there are enough and more stories around, you know, brick and mortar retail will go through, um, you know, a really, really um, tough time. But I think, I mean, Jaipur um, or any, any craft business uh, which has an online presence, uh, now is the time for them to be able to leverage their um, online presence and gently nudge their audiences, customers into being able to do as much contactless shopping as uh, mm -hmm. they'd like to do. And, uh, you know, uh, I think in terms of sensibility of product, uh, more mindful, more purposeful consumption. I mean, um, you know, there's uh, plenty of conversation around how. Um, on the one hand, consumerism will take a little bit of a beating. I mean, if you go with uh, the theory that um, Anshul has, uh, you know, been talking about, then uh, you know, I think there's room and scope for uh, lots more mindful and purposeful um, consumption. And uh, I mean, online is really the best place to be, um, you know, um, selling at just now, in view of the way the environment is. So to be able to really um, uh, be able to to tell those stories, to be able to make those connections through the online um, channels is, is uh, really, you know, what one would uh, focus on and allow for the retail spaces, the retail storefronts to really become a lot more conversational around, uh, you know, what the new needs of the, the you know, changing um, customer are. All right, uh, Meeta, I'm going to come back to you. Many designers complain that uh, industry doesn't take them seriously enough in good times. And in a crisis time like this, when budgets are getting cut, they don't take them even seriously, even more so. But I know that you at Ray and Keshwin, when you were at Ray and Keshwin, you never had this problem. R&K was always taken seriously by industry. What's your secret sauce? Did you just bully them? You're on mute, uh, Meeta. I'm sorry, you'll have to repeat. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, well, first of all, thank you for, you know, saying that we were taken seriously. Yeah, very. Uh, did we bully them? Uh, yes. Okay. I think short answer to that. But I think that uh, what happened was really that we always looked at design. So it's about, you know, I, I, and it, it relates to what Hema said right at the beginning of this. What is your culture? What drives you? Mm -hmm. And I think the RNK culture was very much about design being a response or a solution to a business problem never about just design and a vacuum or design as a craft alone. Mm -hmm. so when you have that approach, you know, we spent a lot of time on every project. We would spend a lot of time, energy, resources on figuring out what was the solution to the business problem and what was design's role in it, which I think we presented with a reasonable amount of clarity. Mm -hmm. So we always spoke the language of the boardrooms and perhaps that's why, uh, you know, as you say, we were taken seriously. 
And I think just one more thing I want to add is that again, uh, going back to our DNA, we were always an organization that was very scale focused. So we liked big projects, we liked mm -hmm. countrywide rollouts. And when that happens, uh, you gain a reputation for perhaps being someone who can guide big clients mm -hmm. through minefields. Okay. And that helps again, you know, when you're taken more seriously. All right. So scale focused and learn to speak the language of the boardroom. I'm going to come back yeah. and ask you what exactly this language is and how one learns it. But before that, I'm going to go to Anjali Bansal once again. Anjali, uh, as an individual investor in the stock market, when, when you have a crisis and the market falls, I look at value investing. I look at buying stocks that were previously expensive and are now cheap. Does a VC look at investment opportunities in the same way? Would you look at a crisis like this and say, I can actually invest in a few new companies or I can, or I can increase my stake in my existing company? So not exactly for those reasons. So mm -hmm. let me sort of try and address this more holistically. Actually, Warren Buffett said very recently, he's sitting on cash. Mm -hmm. And despite the market Lucky falling, fellow. whatever it is, 30%, 40%. And I know a lot of very, very smart investors, much smarter than I in public markets, mm -hmm. are actually choosing to wait to see how the market mm -hmm. behaves. Because mm -hmm. I mean, one of the worst things you can try and do is try and time the stock market. We never really okay. know what is the bottom, what is the top. Mm -hmm. But uh, moving away from public markets, I think at a time like this, what we are looking at, and indeed much of the VC world is looking at, is not opportunistic investing necessarily. Mm -hmm. It continues to be focused on, if it was our existing portfolio, what does our portfolio need? Uh, are they comfortably uh, cash positioned? Do they need more capital? If they need more capital, then you know, if the existing investors, the current investors in a company believe in the company, they will continue to support it through investment. On the other hand, you know, if you're in a happy position where your companies are generally operating positive, do not necessarily have a cash crisis, then they don't need capital. Then you don't need to necessarily put capital in more just to take more ownership because ultimately your success as a VC uh, is predicated on the success of the entrepreneur. So we tend to think of it that, listen, if the company succeeds, if the entrepreneurs make money, then we'll make money, our investors will make money, right? We are also fiduciary, we're actually managing other people's money. Mm -hmm. So it's less about taking more ownership because taking excessive ownership on a company actually is detrimental. Mm -hmm. You want your entrepreneur and your management to team freedom. to continue to have lots of upside in the business. Mm -hmm. so, so you want to be partners and supporters mm -hmm. with very good sort of performance management. But not controllers and not for the wrong reason. Got it. Yeah, not for the opportunistic reason of, you know, you, you are needy. So, you know, let me take more ownership. Anjali, follow-up question. Now, lots of designers are in the audience today and many of them run their own design firms. Many of these mm -hmm. design firms are profitable, but not scalable. It's a consulting business. It's usually dependent on a small group or a mm -hmm. medium-sized group of uh, creative professionals. If one of those people were to walk into your office and give you a 90-second elevator pitch, would you listen? I would absolutely listen. I would also advise them not to think about raising, raising VC money, or at least I would ask them, why do they want to raise capital? Mm -hmm. What are they going to use the capital for? Mm -hmm. or will it accelerate their growth? Mm -hmm. um, if yes, how will it create returns for them and their investors? Mm -hmm. Because unlike a regular, say, you know, if you take a bank loan, mm -hmm. so often, you know, service businesses, for example, will say, well, you know, if I had more money, I could grow faster. And then the mm -hmm. question to ask is, well, do you really need equity mm -hmm. for which you will have to generate equity returns? Or do you just need working capital debt? Mm -hmm. So if you need working capital, then by all means, go to a bank and get a loan for working capital, which you will have to service at something between 8 to 12% interest rate, which presumably if you have a good, healthy, robust business, uh, any kind of service business is actually a cash flow business, right? So you're generating enough cash, underlying cash flow to service your debt. Then why do you need equity? Okay, getting equity, getting yeah. external equity is like riding a tiger, right? Particularly VCs because early stage VCs are required mm -hmm. to generate very large returns. And they're mm -hmm. going to ask you to grow much faster, generate a lot more profit, which you may not, not be able to. Uh, Anjali, one more question to you. I'm sorry to harass you so much. Like I said, you're the only VC on the panel. So many financial questions will come to you. How come we never hear of something called venture debt? Why is it always venture equity? So there is now venture debt, actually. Okay. And uh, not only is there venture debt, it's not a very prevalent model yet. There are mm -hmm. very few, there are three or four venture debt funds in India at this point. Mm -hmm. And they're still operating as funds. Mm -hmm. So it's still a sort of short cycle thing. I think what is really required is 
venture debt like regular mm-hmm. lending products okay so more working capital type okay. product mm-hmm. for whether it is startups or service firms okay and earlier okay. you know in the in the old days if you will the banks used to do it then the nbfc used to do it now pretty much nobody does it or they it is uh, or there is a debt that is available to small service firms Mm-hmm. at fairly high interest rates because then they get underwritten as individuals so it's really your individual credit it's like taking a credit card loan it's like yep understood yep, yeah okay hema next question to you uh people will suffer job cuts or uh, uh, job losses or pay cuts in this environment in this already slowing economy which is slowing well before the the covid pandemic hit us large companies infosys cognizant tata motors may be able to manage this kind of uh, volatility how can small and medium enterprises uh, like many people in our audience how can they manage this uh, this this period yeah so i think when we are talking micro small and medium scale we are really talking about companies which are anywhere in the 5 crores to about maybe 250 300 and you know in that kind of numbers under 20 to about maybe 300 350 and uh, i think uh, you know recent surveys that are coming out and as you said the larger companies have a bigger muscle and little bit more mm-hmm. flex so then they have the ability to do things like deferring or cancelling promotions deferring or uh, postponing or saying reducing their performance bonuses or even reducing their salaries in a graded manner or across the board companies are also looking at things like how do you convert these bonuses or these salaries into equity so that mm-hmm. it's something into the future Mm-hmm. and how are they then at the last retro- resort really looking at job losses mm-hmm. but i think job losses lo- should really should be the final trigger you may come to it pretty soon in some of these cases where there is a challenge mm-hmm. but if you can delay it do it you know part time work sharing mm-hmm. uh, keeping them on the payroll furloughs all of these are options that are coming out in surveys which chros of mid size to large scale i'm not really mm-hmm. talking about the micro i really talking about but i think how do you soften the landing how do you actually ensure there is no one size fits all suresh mm-hmm. but i think it's important to at the at the heart of it understand the emotions that are going to drive employees and the most important emotion is going to be one of fear mm-hmm. you see what is going to happen to me in the future is my job safe is my paycheck going to come so and is my health safe so i think there is that whole thing the second issue that's really going to be is that some people are saying i love to work from home i don't want to go back to a work space and some people are saying i'm fed up of it i want my social um, connect i want my social fix i have to go to it so there is that type then there is the third type of people who are really worried that there's this little virus which has wiped out families lifestyles etc and then of course there's the survivorship who's saying i want to spend more time with my family with my children and just gratitude that i am around so as a leader i think you will have to soften the blow by understanding at the very core these emotions that drive and you know it's very tough because you are also nervous and you know the the swedish have apparently a phrase for it and they call it is e magen i hope i got the as uh, the pronunciation right it's ice in the belly you should really know when to pull the trigger you know you have to take decisions you may have to take very hard decision merit versus means is not a very easy decision do you keep a person who's able to do two people's job or do you keep a person who's a single income family dependent on this mm-hmm. job um can you network can you create talent exchanges like shilpa said where people can actually find other options do you handle them do you counsel do you provide mental counseling to people do you employ involve employees in co creation so that they feel they're part of the solution and not really the problem and do you not run to cut employee costs because look at how your expenses figure out what are the big ticket items in your expenses mm-hmm. and if employees is not that big ticket then don't pull the trigger on that first look okay. at all the other uh, you know uh, other issues okay. and finally of course uh, don't forget the extended workforce you know the retailer staff the supplier employees mm-hmm. all of these mm-hmm. i think that's very important because then again this whole issue about organizational purpose values all that comes into play and you feel you're part of an organization which is not just doing it for itself but for the larger ecosystem so if i were to kind of anagram i mean use a uh, anagram i would say the leader must care he must communicate he must communicate not just one way it must be two way he has to listen he has to be agile 
you know, prolonged torture is really bad. If you have to take swift decisions, the instant guillotine is better. He has to be resilient and he has to be reassuring. And finally, he has to have empathy. And just one last point to Mita. Yes, I know boards took them very, very seriously. And I personally think it's because they aligned very strongly with business strategy and understood organizational value and organizational purpose. All right. Uh, Hema, I'm going to add he or she to your answer, to your care uh, acronym that you use. <laughs> yeah. Right. I like the, the phrase ice in the belly. It sounds like something you hear in Game of Thrones. <laughs> All right. It's time for poll number three uh, from the audience. I'm sure if you can fire poll number three. Right. What is your fundamental motivation? Why did you start your design practice, your design business, working for a design firm, your design and retail business, perhaps something to do with design? Why did you start? Got sick of working in a large company and the politics, wanted to be my own boss. Little did I realize that I'd be my own boss and I'd be working 24 hours a day to get rich, really, really rich, or to make a difference to the world at large. Three, two, one, and end of poll. All right, so overwhelming 60% says to make a difference to the world. Very few people, 6% says, to get rich, really, really rich, then it's good that you don't know what a term sheet means because then you won't get VC money and they won't, you won't be riding a tiger. And I really wanted to be my own boss uh, is another answer. All right. Let's move on with our discussion. Anshil, uh, a lot of people are talking about craft businesses, artisanal businesses, handmade in India. What's the future? What are future opportunities in this long boom for businesses like these and therefore for designers who work in those areas? Uh, uh, Suresh, I could speak for hours on this subject, mm -hmm. but uh, two minutes. If I was to summarize in three minutes, I would, uh, um, I think uh, the two big uh, opportunities and I would say essentials, I would, I would put them in two buckets and then I'll come back to elaborate them. But for, uh, number one, it is essential to create a human connect today. And I'll elaborate. I totally agree with him. It's a, it's a moment of empathy. Everyone uh, in the whole ecosystem needs that. Um, you know, the, uh, for example, when we look at artisans, their first concern is support. The second concern is assurance. And the third one is revenue. Mm -hmm. You know, and all these three uh, things uh, are, are, are important. You know, like new collaborative models will need to, uh, to emerge. I've always said uh, um, that uh, an artisan uh, has surely a pair of hands, but it's not just that. He's got a mind and he's got a heart as well. Or she. she. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we rarely bring them into play. And there is a huge opportunity. You know, we, uh, we treat them uh, as suppliers whenever convenient. Mm -hmm. But in fact, he's dependent and he's independent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm saying, please, he or she, he or she yes. whatever. It's no <laughs> Let's take that for, um, for granted. But it, uh, actually, an artisan is a mix of employee and an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. he is actually both. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to uh, begin to uh, uh, approach that uh, uh, as such. And another aspect of human connect is actually at both ends. We need to regain the trust mm -hmm. of both the artisanal ecosystem as well as the customers. Uh, the trust will have to be regained, rewound. Uh, uh, I think uh, everyone in, in today's uh, world is a startup, irrespective of the size. And uh, that, uh, that really means that uh, you've got to go out afresh. And lastly, I would say on the human connect aspect, the transparency and the provenance. Uh, uh, these things are absolute must. And these are opportunities to do now. Um, the other thing, uh, and I've been saying this to every entrepreneur who comes uh, to the to the class. I mean, uh, at I am Ahmedabad, I I, uh, I also run, as you know, um, yeah. I, I co-chair the program called Creative and Cultural Businesses Program at I am, uh, which I've been running now for seven years for creative uh, and lifestyle and uh, cultural entrepreneurs. And the first thing I tell them, and this has never been a greater and more important moment, mm -hmm. that uh, think ten times before you give birth to a new product or a service. Okay. They, must be, they must be thoughtful, original, unique, and they must serve a purpose. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't belong. Uh, and today, 
globally, more retailers or brands will actually look for those unique products that cannot be produced just anywhere. Otherwise, they'll uh, uh, the manufacture or source mm -hmm. nearby. So that's uh, that's another extremely important uh, moment. But the opportunities are immense. Home as a category is up for a total rethink. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but not just uh, in home decor, but uh, in kitchen, in hosting house parties. You know, in reimagining home as a new center of productivity. Today we are living there, we are loving there, we are working there, we are playing there. So there is a complete role for uh, the creative architecture to answer all the new, new opportunities. Uh, you know, and, uh, and I think uh, a larger opportunity is for um, uh, stylists or curators who can imagine things coming together. Uh, so uh, new services, new creative ecosystem is going to, uh, to be born here. Um, Well-being, another huge opportunity. And uh, of course, the digital solutions. I think uh, even, even uh, for uh, anyone who is into online, and Shilpa would agree with me, that uh, you know, digital solutions, especially uh, fronting the customer, mm -hmm. is, uh, is an area where I uh, expect to see a huge uh, creative explosion. Mm -hmm. You know, especially to support the handcrafted products that need, you know, a special uh, emotional engagement of the consumers. And uh, that uh, con uh, consumer uh, experience, uh, I expect digitally to be become more personal, more immersive, more intelligent, but also more emotional and more seductive. Uh, and I think that uh, that is where um, uh, the, the artisanal um, handcrafted products from India Will, will win in the world. I think it's the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Anshul. Shilpa, Anshul just said that he advises his students at IAMA, if they want to be entrepreneurs, to think it through very, very carefully. Why are you doing what you do? So here's my question to you. From all my interaction with entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship is clearly both exciting and stressful at the same time. Right? You have incredible highs and incredible lows. If you could live your life all over again, would you personally want to be an entrepreneur again? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would go back and do this over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always enjoyed building things from scratch and the need to be authentic and the, the need to ensure that whatever it is that I do um, is not really, uh, you know, going to put me into a also ran box because mm -hmm. um, I believe that, you know, there will always be people who can shout louder than you can spend, mm -hmm. you know, bigger box than you can. And they'll have had you for breakfast before you even wake up. So, I mean, as Anshul said, you know, spend more and more time on your value proposition. But I'm, I feel when I look back, um, you know, 10 years of being an entrepreneur, the three businesses, the three brands that I uh, did, did uh, uh, you know, build from scratch, jepo.com and, uh, you know, the restaurants uh, in Goa and Bombay Mustard um, and my travel, um, experiential travel company, Brickway. I mean, I, I, I think I, I, I have lots to feel good about because we eventually ended up building businesses uh, which became, uh, I mean, building brands, which became much larger than the size of the business, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would do this all over again. I've got, um, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've always believed in taking a leap of faith. If I believe in something enough, I'm just going to, you know, uh, take a leap of faith, uh, faith and just jump right into it. But of course, I mean, you know, the path to entrepreneurship is, is ridden with landmines. And when you're a woman entrepreneur, you know, there's just, uh, you know, you have to just, work twice as hard. Okay. It's just doubly challenging, right? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, there are many lessons, right? And in hindsight, Vision 2020, as everybody says, fun fully intended. Um, the truth is that you learn so many lessons from, uh, you know, your experiences um, as an entrepreneur. And as long as, you know, we're able to learn uh, uh, good lessons from um, past experiences, from other people's failures. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I'm always telling uh, uh, young entrepreneurs that I uh, that I mentor also Ram Ahmedabad and elsewhere is that uh, you know I mean there are enough and more people um, who've tried to do something that you're wanting to do you know to we're also wedded to our ideas that we believe that we're the only ones who thought about it but the truth is that there's enough and more people who've gone out and done it so you have to find those people people mm -hmm. who succeeded you've got to find them people who failed miserably you've got to find those people as oh. well mm -hmm. so that you know you you have the opportunity to learn from their mistakes and i think the ecosystem today is just so willing to share it's so enabling that uh, you know entrepreneurs today i think have the advantage of learning from um, you know the experiences of those who've been at it for the last 20 25 years not something that you know we had the advantage of like 10 years ago so i think there's 
um you know there's there's lessons around you know choosing partners there's lesson lessons around uh building a circle of safety which could include uh looking for a mentor who's going to have your back who's going to be there for you to be used as a sounding board to not be you know judging you uh and somebody who just you know gives you the support um uh, you know that you need to not fall and that's okay. not necessarily your partners and your investors that's more certainly people outside you know people who are not really part of um part of uh, the business not attached to the business so look plenty of lessons and but i mean the high that one gets out of um out of you know being able to build something give something mm-hmm. you know a, a whole new life uh, the the gratification is just immense so yeah i'm i'm also not employable at all so okay. i guess my <laughs> response also comes from from believing that uh you know i i i find it hugely annoying to have to drag too many people behind me when i believe in something i want to just go out and do it all right yeah. Meeta, next question for you. Design is rarely covered by a mainstream and new age media, digital media. You're one of the few media houses that is solely dedicated to design and the creative arts. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing for sure. Okay. Because more people, are, you know, one of the problems with the design world is that it's just too insular, mm-hmm. and we all designers speak to designers. you know we don't speak and i'm so which is why i'm thrilled to see this panel because at least no designers the, at all yeah no it's it's great it's this is what is the need of the hour but back to your question about media i think it's not fair to say that design uh, is not covered in media it is but you have to ask yourself what kind of design is covered mm-hmm. so fashion is covered very extensively mm-hmm. architecture is covered very extensively you know furniture what is covered is stuff that looks good mm mm-hmm. so what determines media coverage is either a famous designer name or aesthetic mm-hmm. and that is wrong because media doesn't cover design as a solution and i think that has to change and the responsibility for that is not the media suresh that is the communities what can we as a community to do what can sorry i'm let me repeat that what can we as a community do meeta better well one is what this panel is doing speak to people outside of the design community mm-hmm. two is really learn to speak if if we're uh, focusing on media learn to speak in their language learn to impress upon them the importance of design in their language and never has there been a better time you know for the, we're at a moment in indian history where we are finally now accepting that we don't have to look west in fact we can't look west mm-hmm. because the solutions that we are developing in india are now from the ground up and so never has there been a better time to talk about indian design but a lot of things need to change and i think uh, it is our responsibility to make that change happen by taking media with us you know not saying they don't understand which is what i hear a lot of the time We so 45 minutes into this conversation uh, meeta says you need to learn two new languages you need to learn how to speak business and you need to learn how to speak media no i think it's it's not about speaking two languages or four languages you you need to designers in any case do right they are able there's you 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 have an empathy for your user and you're able to speak their language that's all i'm asking you to do empathize right. with the person opposite you and speak their language Anjali next question for you and I'm going to quote Adi Gorich on this. Uh, he once uh, told us I used to work at CNBC then. He said always raise money when you can not when you need to. I I, I guess the war time equivalent would be uh, buy weapons during peace time. Is this good advice for designers and creative entrepreneurs? Keep a stock a store of money handy whenever you can. Rahul tell. Adi said that uh, it must come from a place of deep wisdom which we know is there. Um So I think raising money is one of those buzzwords, which needs to be very carefully examined. What does raising money mean? Yeah, what does it mean? Um, it has to come from a place of how much money do you need? Mm-hmm. What do you need it for? Mm-hmm. What are you going to do with it? And in return for that money, what are you giving away? Mm-hmm. So you, if had you just asked the question, should businesses raise money when they can versus when they need? I would have said, yeah, I mean, it makes sense if you. if you have growth plans that you know you are need to mm-hmm. you're going to have to need to fund at some point then certainly by all means if the markets are good you know go out and raise a bit of money and keep it handy on the other hand and we spoke about this earlier in the discussion today for service businesses 
my big question always is what will you do with that money all right so that's the and, question uh, and the use of funds actually is a very important conversation for all entrepreneurs to have early mm -hmm. on when they start thinking about raising money and building what is called the cap table right so mm -hmm. how much first of all what do you need money for so what is the use of funds mm -hmm. how much money do you need who are you going to raise money from because remember they are not just investors unlike public markets where it is a very diversified distributed investor base your investors as an entrepreneur are actually not just people who give you money and go away right they are mm -hmm. actually your partners in the business so raise high quality money from people who care about you and your business who understand it and who are actually going to be partners in the journey because like all journeys it will have highs and it will have its abysmal lows mm -hmm. so they have to be able to stand with you through that so by all means think about raising money but ask yourself what am i going to do with the money if it's just about you know i'm going to build a fancy office then please do not raise money to build a fancy office all right final audience poll or if you're going to build a fancy office then certainly lean in and and check with your design friends as to make it a useful fancy office all right try and avoid fancy offices that's one lesson we've all learned in this pandemic right final audience poll what does indian design need at this moment a ministry of good design i don't know how good ministries are <laughs> many people say the software industry became what it became because there was no ministry of software tax ops like the software industry got in the 70s and the 80s intense competition for quality of product more design festivals webinars like this one what do you think we need five more seconds to and close the poll all right many people have faith in the government the ministry of good design is what uh, our audience thinks will will actually give design the much needed boost it needs and more design uh, more design festivals and webinars we at adi only too happy to organize them intense competition and nobody wants a tax shop so that's a good question uh, good uh, response one less thing we can ask the government for anche let me ask you a practical question uh taking off from what anjali said the immediate challenge for many designers right now and design led businesses and creative entrepreneurs is cash flow there's just no sales no cash coming in what's a good short term strategy i don't have cash coming in but i have cost going out yeah uh, this is a difficult one in current circumstances uh, i empathize with everyone uh having said that if we challenge ourselves um uh, things are possible and uh, um you know um i'll give you two examples from very very um, uh, personal quarters uh two two companies that we've been actually uh, advising um both the cases it's as long as you have a very compelling offer pre orders is something which is entirely possible mm -hmm. pre orders even without having any promise of when the delivery will happen because everyone mm -hmm. understands everyone mm -hmm. is at the tech mm -hmm. uh so it really first of all uh, i come back to my original point and shilpa mentioned for me i'm a i'm a i keep repeating the word uh, value market fit and value proposition like a parrot but uh, if you get that right the rest becomes very 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 easy including managing the revenue and the cash flows today mm -hmm. um uh, you know there is there's a nice cream brand um uh, not very large uh, actually artisanal uh, ice cream brand which during the covid period has actually uh, doubled its uh, revenues mm -hmm. um, staying at home and home delivery and very simple very very simple uh, actually uh, as i was saying well being is very important and at this time uh, you know this a feeling of goodness is very important so it was a very simple whatsapp message that was sent to all the patrons which said share the warm joy of frozen handcrafted uh, uh, ice cream mm -hmm. with your friends and the just people just kept uh, sort of gifting them mm -hmm. to to other people you know just uh, picking out the, so i'm i'm saying uh, there are uh, possibilities which can very very easily be uh, you know and as long as your product is good your uh, value proposition is good there are answers uh, another case uh, i don't want to go into the detail we have actually revised the the, the revenue ambition by 5x mm -hmm. uh, and it's artisanal design led product simple okay so it's uh, it's something uh, very very important i say manage the today and prepare for tomorrow preparing for tomorrow is equally important 
uh, and and I said uh, particularly when it comes to design uh, 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 artisanal design, which is uh, the backbone of India, um, there are two aspects, uh, three aspects which are critical, which have uh, not really been addressed very well. Number one, affordability. Number two, quality and uh, performance functionality. Uh, going forward, the market is not going to accept anything less. Yes, sustainability is going to be very important. But yes, handcrafted artisanal products are going to be very important. On the back but of the all customer these is going to demand this. And uh, you know, the, the solutions are going to come by, uh, as I said, uh, co-creating, collaborating uh, with, uh, with the artisans, coming, with, uh, coming up with uh, actually management solutions, quality solutions together with the appropriate uh, kind of uh, uh, incentives. Uh, and we've experimented with this, it works. Um, another thing, uh, which is a really collaborative uh, go-to-market. This is an era of collaboration, not competition. All right. That brings me to my, sorry. I'm yeah. going to say three things that we've been telling all our entrepreneurs. Yeah, tell us. First and foremost, you don't know what the next three to six months will bring. Mm -hmm. Conserve cash every which way you can. Mm -hmm. Renegotiate all agreements, particularly rent and so on and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. Find ways to extend, to avail of moratorium services. A lot of small firms actually are MSMEs. So if you've actually registered as an MSME, see what benefits you can participate mm -hmm. in from government programs. Uh, mm -hmm. I know it takes long and it's painful and so on, but if there are benefits, you should avail of them. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing you must not absolutely not compromise on are statutory dues. So mm -hmm. do not compromise and make sure your statutory dues are paid mm -hmm. on time and in mm -hmm. full. Uh, work with your team. Mm -hmm. and your colleagues, because after all, they're your partners in this journey. However many employees you have and share the pain, mm -hmm. uh, make sure the pain starts from the top. Mm -hmm. So leaders of the organization must take comp cuts before they start laying off people if they do, or asking people further down to take comp cuts. I know several situations, all my companies, actually the founders and CEOs, including not just uh, startups, but even large listed companies that I'm on the board of, mm -hmm. have voluntarily taken fixed comp cuts. Because that is what gives you then the moral right to be no, able to talk to your colleagues and say, okay, you know, we need to face the pain together. So first and foremost, conserve cash. Second, this is the time to actually go get the voice of the customer. Mm -hmm. Over invest in, in asking and soliciting feedback, listening to your customers, your clients, mm -hmm. whoever they happen to be, and incorporating that in your own design going forward. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is use this time to innovate, to think about how to repurpose your business, reimagine your business, and redeploy, repurpose your teams because there is some tremendous human capital that sits in firms. Um, use them for something else, maybe new product development, new services. I know of several situations where they're not design firms, but service firms. They have spare capacity. They said they reached out to a number of people, including you know Niti Aayog and various mm -hmm. sort of um, industry initiatives, including Avana, my firm, saying. Can we do projects with you? Can we do some new research? Can we find, can we do some new ideation and design? Mm -hmm. So work pro bono. It's a good time to learn. It's a good time to build relationships. So okay, final days. question to Hema. Thank you, thank you, Anjali. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you, thank you, Ansel. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, Hema, final question to you. We're almost at our one hour limit, so I'm going to keep the question brief. Many people recommend a leaner in-house team and more collaborations at this time to, to cut costs and to streamline operations. That brings with, with its own kind of frictions. That comes with its own frictions of working remotely, of having one team under one leader and the others far away. How do leaders manage, manage these frictions? Yeah, when you look at people's <coughs> strategies, Suresh, I think we have to look at it both from the demand side and the supply side. Demand side is, you know, what are the kind of people you need? What are the kind of processes, the systems, suppliers? How do you actually hire them, recruit them, engage them, and all of that? So if I were to look at the kind of teams that are going to emerge, I think they're going to be very much more hybrid teams, which will have gig people, work from home, et cetera. There will be global talent pools. So, you know, you can compartmentalize and, you know, it's very liberating because you can really hire people from across the world. So global talent strategy, compartmentalize and localize and work design itself will have to be virtual as well as at different locations. Now, how do you manage? You have to manage at the individual level, at the manager level, at the organizational level. At the individual level, I think individual work discipline and work ethic becomes very, very important. And comfort with working collaboratively, using the hardware and the software and the mindware 
to do that is very critical. Also, I, while you need to be very clear about the product that you have in mind, I think individuals will have to be comfortable working in the beta mode. So you can't work to perfection at all times. Mm -hmm. Managers will have to be comfortable managing appraisals, normalizations, whatever it is in a virtual mode. Good time management because you can't do last minute work and expect virtual teams to kind of collaborate and regular check-ins. Enabler functions will have to ensure hardware, insurance, the technology, all that is up to speed. And I think organizations itself will have to leverage skills across industry. For example, ivory carvers are very good in looking at microns. So can you use them in some industry where they really can use that skill, that learning agility, mm -hmm. and then bring that in? And you know, to Anchil's point, uh, the management and design have to come together, or to Mita's point. So management focusing on the ROI and design focusing on human and society so that you have really a holistic issue and a holistic framework, and then you reduce the friction. All right, so what Hema is saying is we need to redesign uh, work and we need to redesign design in itself, how designers work in itself. Great opportunity, uh, both a mixture of fear and uh, excitement there. All right, I know we're almost out of time. I'm going to uh, take a few audience questions. Panelists, if I can request you to keep your questions really short and snappy, we can try and get a few audience questions in. First question for Anjali. For people who run a service design firm, how do you go about making your firm uh, attractive for an acquisition? Outright be very acquisition. Okay, so be very unique and distinctive in what you do. So it's quite differentiated and thus there is a value proposition for an acquirer. Let it be financially very attractive, so i.e. not just large, actually be very profitable. So they are getting skills, they're getting new service lines, and they're getting a brand and quality as well as profit. Hey, my next question to you. Uh, Manu Nilakantan asks, design studios have always been very casual, small family of, uh, uh, of workers coming together and no official HR policy of any kind. At a time like this, is that a strength or a weakness? I think, you know, it's the values and the purpose that drive. Uh, I worked in organizations which were small and when they were small, they were very, very robust in their HR philosophy and policies. It's finally at the heart of, you know, how the leader walks the talk, how does he drive from the front, how does he take ownership, and how does he communicate both his, by transparency as well as his vulnerability and earn that credibility. So I don't think formal policies are anywhere required, but the intent is important, fairness, and, you know, uh, deciding and showcasing how you came to certain decisions and listening to employees. These are basic ethos. You don't need fossilized policies to make it a strong human relations oriented organization. All right, Ashish Deshpande asks a fairly complex question and I'm going to summarize this question. He says, if I were to hold a gun to the entire panel's head, don't worry, he's not holding any guns. Uh, what would, how would you prioritize focus during this time? You have three issues, finance, human resources, and business development. Meeta, I'm going to put this question to you. At a time like this at design firm, should they focus on finances, human resources, or business development? Or all of the above? You're on mute, Meeta. Sorry. Sorry, yes. Uh, so the easy answer is, of course, all three of them. And I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want that to seem like a cop-out. But so my answer would be that if you're a design firm, you're clearly more than one or two people, right? So I would, what I would do is make different people responsible for each of these three aspects. So it's not just one or two founders who are burdened with trying to do everything together. Uh, pick people, give them the responsibility because there's no way to avoid any of these three. All right. So actually he said, don't choose all three is not an option, but oh well. <laughs> no, I'm saying... I know, I know. I got, I got I'm it. Saying divide, uh, I got it. Divide the responsibilities. Yeah. Anshul, like, I have a question that asks, I don't Can know. Can I answer that? Just yeah. one point. Absolutely. Him. I would say take care of your employees. They'll take care people of your first. customers. Actually, if, if you permit, I will say the same thing. You must, it's people first. People, people first, first finances and business development later. And they, they will follow, actually. They will yeah. follow. They will take care of it. Yeah, yeah. The people will take care of it. Anshul Jain, is it a good time for designers to uh, take a pivot from the design service business and start creating products? Ooh, you know, uh, that's, a, uh, that's not a, a, a question I can uh, answer without knowing exactly what, uh, or, what, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no one answer. I think uh, the, 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 the simple truth is, 
that, that the boundaries between product and service uh, are, are, are collapsing. Um, uh, today, um, uh, it's, it's a moment of what I call the omni brand. You know, what used to be a purely a product has to pivot into service as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, even even uh, at IIM Ambabad, for example, when we are running this program, it's, uh, we are uh, imparting learning, but at the end of it is productized in form of a certificate. So people come for both the things. And uh, uh, so um, uh, I think um, uh, the answer is you, you've got to figure um, what your um, uh, precise offer is. Uh, I don't know what uh, what kind of a design okay. firm is. My, my, a lot of design uh, firms. The important, important thing uh, at this stage, I would say, is that it is not the time to uh, play to your strengths only. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the your muse is changing. Your cus uh, target cus consumer is changing. Listen to them very carefully. In fact, listen to the whole ecosystem very carefully. Because the answers and the solutions will come uh, from uh, the systemic changes that are going to happen around you. Not just from the uh, consumer, but uh, staying with the consumer, uh, knowing, uh, knowing uh, where that behavior is going, you, you may have to acquire new capabilities. So okay. it's not just about playing to your strengths, it's about playing to your strengths at the same time, acquiring to the new capabilities. Shilpa, next uh, question. Yeah, Shilpa, would you like to weigh in on the same? You're on mute, Shilpa. So no, the one thing that I do want to say is that I think businesses across board, right? Regardless of whether they're lifestyle businesses or uh, more mainstream uh, businesses really need to be investing a lot more in design than they otherwise mm -hmm. do. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, design is just seems to be, a, by the way, uh, more of an afterthought, you know, and um, established businesses have the bandwidth and the wherewithal to always be ahead of themselves, you know, to stay ahead of their game, they're going to have to innovate a lot more and, you know, uh, invest in design. And I mean, I don't watch any television, but you know, when I do uh, in the passing, uh, I'm just looking at the advertising and saying, oh my God, what's happening to, uh, you know, creative these days? What's happening to, uh, you know, product these days? So the thing is that, you know, I think the uh, payoff of an investment in design cannot be undermined. I mean, I just needed to make that point in the context of this whole... Excellent. That's, uh, that's, that's good discussion. news to all the designers listening. Shilpa, final question for you. A couple yeah. of people have asked us this. Uh, how should I go about starting to learn about business plans, term sheets, scaling my business? What is a good starting point for a designer who wants to turn entrepreneur? Well, um, I Attend think... Course, um, go to I said a little... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to plug that, you know, I've just done enough of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, what I did say earlier on in the conversation is that the ecosystem at this point in time is really, really very enabling, very supportive. Um, I think anybody who wants to uh, become a, a, an entrepreneur, being in design, all, all they need to do is really, you know, put the word out and go talk to some entrepreneurs and understand from them what their journey has been, learn from them. Uh, you know, how they went about, um, uh, you know, creating their whole uh, uh, business plan and, uh, you know, um, fine tuning their product proposition and so on and so forth. I mean, there's enough and more support available for somebody who's willing to listen. Uh, okay. The trouble is only when people think they're, you know, born um, entrepreneurs Geniuses. and therefore don't really need to enlist the support of, uh, and yeah, and one of the most, uh, um, I think one of the biggest lessons of entrepreneurship is to, to take rejection in your face. Okay, and uh, to really, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, taking no for an answer just becomes like uh, second nature. Uh, you shrug your shoulders and say, okay, you know, zada se zada kya karenge na, mana hi kar denge. But that becomes like, you know, the norm. So the truth is that, you know, to know, to have the, to have the maturity to be able mm -hmm. to figure out when you need to ask. We all have trouble asking. So I think, you know, if they can learn, learn to how to ask, yes. And develop yes, a thick that's skill. half the job done. Suresh, yes. I'm going to give two resources for this person, whoever. Who, Absolutely, we'll share it with the community. You can. Uh, yeah. So please us. go check out Thai, T I E, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Indus entrepreneurs. They have chapters mm -hmm. all across India, and Thai runs boot camps, master classes, and they also have a circle of mentors, experts, etc. And the whole purpose of Thai is to help entrepreneurs helping other entrepreneurs. So do reach mm -hmm. out to Thai if you're serious about it. Um, the second is, and we are actually next week launching a masterclass CDs within the Niti Aayog entrepreneurship platform uh, umbrella 
of a sort of business in a box, business boot camp. What are the things you need to think about oh, in starting that's a That's excellent. Okay. So please look for that and sign up. All right. Uh, Suresh, there are also yeah, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who have created ecosystems of uh, other entrepreneurs to, you know, mentor people okay. through this process. And I think that's a very useful network because been there, done that, hand-holding, sharing, you know, their own pains and their own mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. is a very powerful way of helping people mm -hmm. travel that path. But, but okay. most of all, as Shilpa said, don't hesitate to ask. Don't hesitate to ask. Ask like 20 people and believe me, you know, 15 of them will be actually helpful. It's incredible yeah. how helpful people are. All right. I know I've taken up a lot of your time. I'm going to ask Garima Shukla to activate her, uh, uh, her camera and share her screen. Garima has been making sketch notes, which will be shared with all of you immediately after this call. This is sort of a visual minutes of this meeting. So Garima, whenever you're ready, go ahead. There you go. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> All of us are in gear. Yeah, mustard is the uh, color scheme for today. Shilpa, I think, inspired by your restaurant chain. Thank you. Can I make a plug okay. for mustard? Is that allowed? You are absolutely. What do you do nowadays, Shilpa? Let me ask you. It's phenomenal food, phenomenal okay. design, phenomenal everything. Okay. Oh, where thank are, you so are, much for saying that. Where are you based, uh, Shilpa? I'm based in Gurgaon. Okay. And where yeah. are your restaurants? I mean, there's in. Restaurants in Goa and Bombay. Okay. Well, at this right. point in time, uh, you know, it's a tough time. So we're mm -hmm. desperately trying to raise some working capital to okay. be able to write this. Yeah, you should attend one of ADS yeah. webinars. We'll be back with a bomb. Answer questions about we'll how be to back with working capital. All right. Uh, Gariba, this is a beautiful sketch as always. I love the colors. I love the words. Uh, I love the fact that I have even less hair than last time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Garima. Yeah. As always, wonderful work. And panelists, we will share this with you uh, immediately after this call. Uh, Seema, Anshu, Garima, Prakash, and Nishant, can I ask all of you to activate your videos? Prakash, over to you for a few closing remarks. Did you enjoy the webinar? Absolutely. I think, uh, as uh, although I'm kind of today uh, playing a host store here, I've been, always been uh, uh, enjoying this webinar and trying to say, of course, like like uh, most of us in the audience, I'm also a designer. I'm an entrepreneur. I run a team. I uh, I'm responsible. I'm responsible for uh, so many of my team members and all. And it's been a, it's been two months of monthan, two months of like churn that's going on. Mm -hmm. I think this webinar is talking about that. Mm -hmm. I I think I mean like many other designer and entrepreneurs over here, all of us we have reached a point of like saturation, like, you know, like a saturated solution, not like frustration, saturation, but saturation of possibilities, ideas, all that month is happening around. And today's webinar and all of you panelists, thanks so much for you, your insights and idea sharing over here. 